You are listening to This is Oklahoma, hosted by Mike Hearn, telling stories of Oklahomans and those that have made it their home. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of This is Oklahoma podcast. Mike Hearn here, your host, back with another episode. Excited to share this episode with you today. But before we do, I've got to thank our sponsors. First of all, the Oklahoma Hall of Fame. They've been a huge part of this podcast for the last few years. So the Oklahoma Hall of Fame have been sharing Oklahoma story through its people since 1927. For more information on the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, go to www.oklahomahof.com. And for daily updates, go to Oklahoma HOF on Instagram and give them a follow. Our other sponsor today is Chicksaw Nation. Now, the Chicksaw Nation have sponsored pretty much everything in Oklahoma. They're a huge supporter of Oklahoma. And it's an honor to have their name and their brand supporting this podcast. So a huge shout out to Governor Anatoby for supporting this podcast. It really means a lot. Our third sponsor is Diffie Ford Lincoln down in El Reno. Now, this one makes me so happy because these guys are great friends of mine, um, play a lot of golf together. I've bought my cars from them. Do most of my oil changes down there, have a cup of coffee, hang out down in El Reno. It's a good spot to go. And not only are they great friends, but they provide a great service. So for over 60 years, a third generation family owned Oklahoma business down in El Reno. They're also in Bethany as well. So people in the Bethany area know the Diffies really well. But if you're looking for anything new used, um, Ford, Lincoln, or whatever, I'm sure they could find anything you want. Um, check them out, DiffieFord.net, and then on Instagram at DiffieFordLincoln. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of This is Oklahoma. Mike Hunn here, host, back with another episode down at Prairie Surf Studios today. Uh, return guest, Mr. Matt Payne on the podcast. It's good to see you again, mate. It's been a while. Yeah, man. It's good to be back. Yeah, I think we, put, we bumped into each other at the uh, Oklahoma City's most influential event, which was kind of funny. That uh, was. That, that was 250 of us in that match. A lot of influential people. <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny to be on that. I mean, it's great to be on that list and, and it's looking, flicking through that magazine. Like, there's a lot more than 250 people in the city that are movers and shakers, but it was just kind of fun to be in it. Um, and it's always fun to catch up. Like, you know, there's so many people in, in that room or in that event that, like, we all know. Totally. Right? Well, well, it's been cool because, you know, starting Prairie Surf has been. Uh, you know, Rachel and I both talk about how, um, you know, in some ways it was just kind of she and I that started this whole thing, but, but really in so many ways, it's been like the entire city has and really the state has like taken an active role sort of in getting us off the ground, whether it's like speaking at different engagements, doing all those kinds of different things. And the, the four or five party, the most influential, um, there were so many people that, you know, it off, that were there that are influential, that had offered us words of encouragement, um, places to speak. They had, had advocated, that had shared our story and really helped us kind of um, galvanize our space here uh, as, as filmmakers and um, leaders in the city. So it was really, really fun to get to kind of see so many of those people in one spot. Yeah, definitely. So last time we did this, uh, this is, I think this, this will be the third time I think we've sat down. Last time we recorded was um, Christmas of 2021. And we talked a lot about kind of like what you guys had done in education and, and like growing the workforce in Oklahoma through educating yep. and having, you know, building workforce here, um, which for people listening, I'll link that below and you can go kind of listen to that one and Matt's previous one too. Um, catch me up. What's happened in the last two years? Well, it's, uh, it's uh, you, so you say three, but that's three. Uh, this will be the third interview with, as with Prairie Surf Matt Payne. But you're right. Let's we go back four. early on yeah, yeah, yeah. to when I w- had an office at 405 Magazine and I was uh, shooting photographs for 405 Magazine. That 2018. That was yeah, totally. That was kind of the first. Um, and at that time, I was making documentary films and really working kind of as a content creator in all categories in Oklahoma. Um, and, and things have kind of come a little bit full circle here. So, um, you know, Rachel and I kind of shifted uh, from that creative space, you know, her in the sitcom space, me in that documentary space, that photography space into like kind of investing in infrastructure and industry building. And now um, Prairie Surf has launched a new division that is called Prairie Surf Creative. And um, that creative division is uh, all about Oklahoma stories. It's all about... Uh, working with Oklahoma filmmakers and artists to tell kind of Oklahoma stories, not just um, 
the ones that everybody knows, but kind of stories of business, stories of culture, stories of... Uh, of individuals that have done cool things. So anyway, we, we've launched this division and uh, are trying to get the word out. Yeah. What kind of was, you know, obviously in the last two years, a lot of things have happened. The you know, studio's been busy. Um, probably most people will know Tulsa King was a big hit for you guys. Um, and just kind of that in the city was huge. Um, as far as the, the this launching the creative side of things, you're a storyteller, right? Like, you know, most of the people in this in this building are storytellers too, but I think the one thing that you love to do, back to what you said, is like documentaries and photos and films and something you've done and that's kind of been in your blood from, I mean, the classes you took at OCCC, right? Like an OU and all the things you've done there and the reason you went to Hollywood. So it must feel great to like finally do this because I'm sure it's been in the back of your mind for a long time. Yeah, it, it, it has. It, you know, there was there was always this sort of drive, you know, for Rachel and I both to, to get back to our creative roots. That was what this was always about. We just felt that if we could figure out a way to invest in infrastructure that um, that it would create a just a, a broader, sort of richer ecosystem for us to be able to actually thrive as storytellers. Um, the way that, that Prairie Surf Creative kind of came about, it's, it's so it's kind of, there are two different pieces to Prairie Surf Creative. One is sort of an IP content development, and then the other is, is shooting videos uh, for clients that have video needs, um, those video needs for us in, in our minds are, you know, it's high end video, uh, high end sophisticated storytelling. So we see ourselves as, um, kind of just the lead storytellers in the state and the way that the, the this part of the business came about, if you followed our launch at all, you know, we released a trailer to uh, a film called The Jewel, which is a documentary about the Jewel Theater in Northeast Oklahoma City. Well, the idea for the whole creative agency came about um, really when... Um, Councilwoman Nikki Nice uh, had had a conversation with with uh, Rachel and myself as well as Christian Kennedy, our, our other partner, and in it she'd expressed concern about this theater that was very old. It was the last freestanding theater uh, that that came from the era of Deep Deuce um, when that the side of town was thriving. Well, all those buildings that are that were part of Deep Deuce, there's still a Deep Deuce district, but none of the buildings exist. They're all gone. Uh, and so is the culture, except for this one building, this one theater, and this theater is called The Jewel. So our conversation with her was, hey, is there a way to make like a little video or something um, that that could help get the story out, like put it on Facebook or whatever? And so as you know, as we started kind of talking about it and the significance of this theater, um, it became really clear that like a three to five minute, you know, um, hype sizzle uh, fundraising video wasn't going to be the thing. There was really like a documentary that needed to be told here. Um, and in my former life as a, a documentary filmmaker, you know, we talk about Oklahoma stories that need to be told. And there was, and we, you know, m my partner at the time, we made documentaries about Pahuska and the Oklahoma City Thunder. And we did one about the Paseo District and Oklahoma Storm Chasers, all these sort of notable areas. And we'd float around this idea of making a documentary about Deep Deuce um, and and whereas most of the stories we told had had really positive endings the Deep Deuce story kind of ended with urban renewal kind of taking out Deep Deuce and now it's not really there anymore except for the Dan Davis law firm sign mm -hmm. um, and a bunch of expensive townhomes yeah. um, well telling the story of the jewel was a way to tell the story of deep deuce and what was also cool about it is that there's all this really great development that's going on in northeast oklahoma city so you've got everything that's happening at east point was scrambled and with kindred spirits you know you've got jb and quentin hughes and everybody kind of building this amazing ecosystem over there um a theater is vibrant and a theater sort of helps perpetuate that culture that that's really emerging on the northeast side of town so we thought let's let's try to make a documentary about this um so we did and we interviewed all kinds of really cool people um you know quentin and jb being a couple that were interviewed um councilwoman nikki nice we interviewed uh a historian named anita hill who's amazing as well as arthur hurst uh, and vanessa morrison who is kind of lead charge on um restoring the jewel so the idea is that we would make a film that film would uh then have an impact 
uh, and create awareness, and hopefully that awareness creates a desire to actually invest in, in saving the theater. Um, I think the other thing that's of note, you know, when you think about the sort of disinvestment that's happened on that side of town, particularly around 4th Street, well, I mean, you have Paige Woodson, and there's a lot of develop- development that's sort of beginning to happen. Um, but theaters are the backbones of communities. And if you look at the cool areas in Oklahoma city, I mean, look at 23rd street, think about 23rd street before tower theater. It wasn't the 23rd street we know now look at what, um, look at rodeo cinema and the way that that theater set up in the stockyard city took the stockyards from being the place where Cattleman's was. And you could buy boots to like a place that's really cool. And people want to be, um, I think you can make the same case even for the Yale theater. And while it's not a movie theater, it's a theater venue that has shown films. We premiered Tulsa King there. Um, and it's brought all this attention to Southwest 25th Street. So if we, you know, we, we thought, well, gosh, if you could figure out how to save this jewel theater, um, you're not just saving it for the sake of history, historic preservation, but you're connecting it to a more meaningful future. Well, there's real value in that. So let's use the tool of film and independent filmmaking as a sort of a, a, a launching point to start the narrative around saving the theater. So that's that's kind of what that project has been about yeah how do you look at it like how do you sustain that right because there's so many it's not cheap to do what you do right and there's so many stories around Oklahoma and I mean you know we could look through all of the podcast guests I've had on like all of them you know there's out of 500 podcasts there's probably 10 documentaries worth of content there like how do you go about that as well as like hey you're running a business here as well Sure. You know, like, is it just like the the high end video side for for clients? Is that just going to fund the the passion project stories that you're going to do, like the Jewel Theater stuff, or not? So there there uh, there are different ways to kind of get these ideas funded. So the yeah. Jewel is something that we've put. It's definitely our blood, sweat, and tears, kind of going into in, into that. Yeah. Um, um, there are other projects that need raised, but the business model for creative is really about, yeah. it is about creating this high end video work for clients that need it. And the way that we've sort of, you know, we've worked with, um, among the projects that we're excited about, you know, we did allied arts campaign and we're kind of their partner in storytelling, which is our tag. Um, We've worked, you know, 405 Magazine. We did a home series you might've seen yeah. um, that turned out really, really cool. Um we're really excited about, uh, we work with Price Business School at the University of Oklahoma. Um, we're, uh, this last weekend we shot, um, we're doing a lot of the storytelling for the Western Heritage Museum and Cowboy Hall of Fame, which uh-huh. has been really, really, really cool. So we were shooting, um, they've got a new marketing campaign that we're kicking off. So we shot the commercials that, that will be used there as well as some of their in-house videos. So yeah. as they're beginning to, to elevate their brand, we're helping them uh, by elevating the story. So what we're doing is, the goal is we're creating an ecosystem where, and, and we're building our team with filmmakers. So as opposed to a traditional ad agency that tends to be sort of brand first, um, graphic designers, p- people that create brands, like we're starting with story um, and working with filmmakers. And what we're doing is we're creating environments where um, not only are we bringing in, you know, really cool talent to help direct these things, um, but we're, we're, we have an internship program where we work with all kinds of young people and we're putting those kids on these projects so that they can begin to work under kind of the best storytellers in town. So we're, we're, we're using it to sort of build a, a, a storytelling ecosystem as well. So, yeah. you know, for us, I mean, we want to work with brands. I mean, what we call our, our tag is partners in storytelling. And what we want to do is we want to find the people, the businesses, the nonprofits, the entrepreneurs, um, the institutions in the state that need elevated story, uh, storytelling to raise money, to, to, you know, launch capital campaigns, those kinds of things, yeah. hype videos. Uh, and we want to make sure that they have the best product and we approach it from a story first lens. Um, what that does is that creates an environment to know where now we have the equipment, we have the personnel, we have the, the, the minds to go, you know what, let's run down the street and shoot an interview with somebody real quick. Cause this could be a really cool story. Once those kind of get up and running, um, then you can go out and you can raise funds to finish those projects. So yeah. that's kind of the way we were approaching it. Yeah. And like you said, you kind of build a pipeline or, or a ladder you know for people to come in and they're working on these projects and then they're around these great people and then slowly they progress in their skills and they move up and they mend it maybe they're on a movie or a series or whatever it is like you're, you're helping the workforce there too sure like you, you know you're in house yeah the last time you and I talked I mean what 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 we spend a lot of time talking about were the different workforce programs that we have and like mm. 
film in Oklahoma has been really addressed through the lens of workforce at places like Oklahoma City Community College and Francis Tuttle. Um, they're looking to train workforce, but you know, you've also got Gaylord uh, at OU, you've got OCU, you've got UCO. All these the, these uh, these schools have creative media programs. Yeah. In, they go by different names, but there are filmmakers that are coming out of these programs. And what we really want to do is is create an environment where these students are are getting to be on sets. It's hard to get them on Tulsa King, and it's really hard to get them on Tulsa King close to the director. You know, they'll be PAs, but they're far they're removed from the creative process by by kind of working with us. You're closer to the creative project. Granted, the scale is smaller. Um, but we're still crafting story and they're learning how storycraft works. Uh, and what that allows us to do is then build our creative crew base, our creative sort of storyteller base, um, so that people can, so that, that there are just more people that are filmmakers and thinking about film, um, and storytelling in Oklahoma. So, and it keeps you in tune as well, doesn't it? With like everything that's happening, you know, cause you could sit in this big building and, deal with your national media stuff and, you know, just have no idea what happens outside these walls. But because of this too, like you've got your ear to the ground and I know that like, that's, that's the last thing you want to do anyway for you. Like, you know, a lot of people, you've always kind of had your ear to the ground and you're very involved as well. Um, so this just kind of helps you stay up to date on that stuff, right? Stay top of mind. Absolutely. I mean, again, like, you know, when you, when you work with allied arts, you know, you're, Working with uh, a nonprofit that is helping Dead Center and the museums and the Philharmonic and the Science Museum, you, you become really aware of of kind of all of those partners. When you work with the University of Oklahoma, you're you know you're working with the university with the Western Heritage Museum. You're telling Western stories and you have access to like you know the cool thing about the the Western Heritage Museum the the, the is the treasure trove of, of sort of untapped narrative that exists in the walls of that place is just wild. I mean, there's, there's 20 years of movies that have, that, that haven't even been touched, you know? Um, and they're so getting access, you know, by helping them tell their stories, we're also kind of getting exposed to some of these really, really cool Oklahoma stories. And the other thing about being prairie, so from the day we turned on our lights, People started sending emails like they have, you know, their family members have really cool stories Their, um, you know, um, they have their own personal journeys. Like people have stories they want to tell. It's why we host writing workshops, you know, so that we can help people craft their stories. Um, but what we want to do is kind of help create a how can we build our business around sort of helping some of those stories get told? And so we're, we're doing it in different ways. I mean, we're uh, one of the other services we provide, which um has been really, really cool is like helping, you know, you have all these, um, you know better than anybody, like there's just, there's so many people that have really unbelievable stories in, it, to tell in Oklahoma. They don't know how to tell them. They don't know if they should write a book. They think it could be a good movie, but they don't know how. Um, they don't know how to write a movie. They don't know whether they should write a movie or a book or they wrote a movie and they couldn't sell it. So one of the things we do is, uh, is we do creative consulting. And so, um, we've got a, a project that, um, is based on a book that was published that, that we've brought on a writer to help this gentleman adapt the screenplay around his life story, um, which is client based work. You know, what, what we want is, you know, when you come to us and say, I have a story that I want to tell, we, we want to hear it, tell it. And then if, if, and then we'll guide you. And then based on kind of what plan we agree to, um, we'll, put a writer on it. We'll help you get your, your story to a place where it's, it's developed enough that you can have a conversation about how to move the needle, whether that's in publishing, producing, whatever it is. So that's another one of the, the services we offer. And, um, and we get a lot of those. So there's so many people that reach out because they just, they want their story told and it's really, really cool. And also like where, yeah, you know, I think one thing I've learned over after doing the podcast and interviewing a bunch of people is that like, we're pretty humble in Oklahoma, right? So a lot of people don't shout from the rooftops, I've got an epic story. It's generally someone in their family that reaches out that says, mm -hmm. hey, you should have this person on the podcast or I've got a friend that's done this. Totally. Right? And there's an abundance of those stories, but it sounds like what you've put together is just a filter process of like, okay, yes, there's your story. Now let's put it into the machine, figure out what the best way to tell it is and come to an agreement and let's, let's go at it with everything we have. Sure. And, and, you know, I think there, there are a lot of, 
um, because, and you're, and you're right, like it is always a family member that's like, hey, my grandfather has a really cool story. Yeah. Um, those tend to be the ones that are, um, they're, they're better to deal with too. There's a, there is a humility there that uh, when you sit them down and they start telling their stories, your brain starts firing and, uh, and it's fun because they, they hear, they see a, someone from, with a film background kind of light up when their story gets told and then they get more excited to tell it, which is, um, which is very cool. But um, yeah, I think, you know, for us, we want people to know that there are avenues, especially now with iPhones and podcasts and, you know, social media and TikTok and everything, like there are avenues to tell your story and we want to guide people so that they, they can actually get their stories told. Yeah. How do you kind of, um, I mean, obviously the product is great and the product is the main thing and it, you know, you want to have pros, you want to process and put out the, and produce the best product you can. How do you go about that? How do you go about raising the bar and, and raising expectations and putting out a product that is the best you can put out? Um, I, you know, I think it starts with the idea, you know, I, I think, you know, it really, it's story first, uh, and then it's building a really good team to help you tell, tell the story. I mean, when you think about a book, I mean, you, you know, someone sits down and writes a book, a painting, you sit down and write a painting, making a film or making a commercial or even making a sizzle or a hype video or a founder story requires a team. And our strategy is very much, uh, it's story first. So we listen to it, the story, we find out where kind of the soul of it is, you know, um, and then we, and then we sort of move from there. Um, and, and then once kind of we've, we've, we've locked into what the, the sort of soul of the idea is we begin to bring in, you know, we'll, we have writers that we work with, we'll bring in and craft a, a voiceover, um, or a script or whatever it is. And then we'll bring in, you know, we work with, uh, a ton of Oklahoma talent, but the majority of the talent we work with has spent time in Los Angeles. So, you know, I'm not a huge f f fan of, of, Hey, let's just bring in people that don't understand Oklahoma. Um, but I do think you know, there's a lot of learning that takes place when you work, uh, where the industry is the biggest, you know, I put myself in that category, you know, if I hadn't cut my teeth in LA for 50 to 15 years, I did, I don't think I would have had a skill that would have allowed me to kind of get to where I am here. So, um, it, you know, we, it starts with a really, really good idea, mm -hmm. finding out kind of what the soul of the story is, um, assigning creative talent to it, and then building a team that knows how to shoot it. Yeah. And it's a combination of using really talented Oklahomans, young people with raw ambition that want to learn, and then plugging somebody in there that's that's done it for 20 years at the highest level. Mm -hmm. And that and it's that that's sort of the formula that we've sort of taken, whether, again, it's like a fundraising video for Price mm -hmm. or, um, you know, a documentary film. Yeah. Talk a little bit that we can dive into the team side of things because I know you you know I, I had the pleasure of, of doing a project with Nadir um, you know on, on my Harold Ham interview and we kind of teamed up with that and had the interns you know he set it up and, and kind of got everything set up and the interns ran everything and it went great um, you know and it, it kind of the, how I envision my podcast in the future right you know two camera set up and, and it went really well um, but Nadir is just one of the perfect examples from what you just said is someone who's you know worked around the business and kind of come to Oklahoma didn't you, I saw something, you, you hired someone else recently, right? You seemed like you're bringing someone back. So you're building a team, which is so we built a team. We're, we're using contractors, but we're um, but the team that we have, you know, we have Tanya Ruby. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, I'll start with my partner, Rachel. I mean, she's not um, as she's not really hands on with creative. But again, like she brings an amazing creative energy um, and passion for film. So, I mean, I'll, I'll sort of start there. And, uh, you know, Tanya Ruby, who's our head of finance, does our, also does the line producing. So she's overseeing the production and, and her background is finance at Marvel, um, you know, spent decades in Los Angeles working at a very, very high level. Um, Nadir comes from a brand's background. Um, Nadir Tavinger is amazing. Um, so he's really bringing that b sort of brand's mentality. Mm -hmm. My background is totally narrative. And then we've got a, a team of, uh, of directors that we work with, um, with varying backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's cool. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's awesome. And then we've got an intern program, uh, that I think I've talked about on here before, but, but we, um, we work with every school, um, uh, every, I think we've worked with every college. We Rose state, O triple C, O U, U C O, O S U and O U, um, O B U, uh, to, we, we just, we bring their media students in, we bring their theater students in and we give them opportunities to work on this stuff. Yeah. 
it's it's great to see. And I think one of the, the other the other video I saw you guys all working on a documentary was uh, Clara Lupa's. Yep. Right? Like, yeah, right. Yeah, I saw that fun. clip of like the circle table, and you yeah. got Stan, uh, King of Stanley Evans, and, and a few other people around the table, and like. That's a really cool scene too. Yeah, I mean that. that so that is so that's an example you asked earlier. Kind of how how are we approaching stories? So that project, um, so it started with the project we did for the Philharmonic. So we did a video. Um, it was a tribute video for Clara Looper for the performance that they did that they commissioned the piece they commissioned about Clara Looper. So the piece was. Um, it, it was this tribute concert and they wanted a video that was a, to sort of to set the scene for the, the, not the concert. And we, we thought about it and we were like, you know, um, we can give like another sort of very abridged history of Claire Looper that talks about the sit-ins or we could do something more. And so we came up with this idea of because you sat, I stand. And what we did was we reached out to, to local, you know, we had governors, mayors, celebrities, Kristen Chenoweth was in it, Reba McIntyre, Wayne Coyne. We Every, everybody uh, that we could get there was a celebrity got up and they said because you sat I stand for and they would say something that they stood for and it tracked back to her leading the sit-in movement so over the course of doing this I, I got to know um, Claire Looper's daughter Marilyn Hildreth who if you haven't interviewed her I strongly suggest you do she's amazing um but she's very much leading, in a lot of ways, the civil rights movement now in Oklahoma City. So we became, we got to know one another uh, in making this video. And then along the way, you know, what, what we discovered was that the Clara Looper story, it's, it's widely unknown, but she really started the sit-in movement, which even at the Smithsonian is credited with beginning in, in Greensboro, uh, North Carolina, uh, in 1961. Clara Looper started having kids sit in in 1958 yeah. um, and in learning about that and how she got that accomplished and listening to Marilyn talk about like she was a child and and her mother was telling her to go into the lion's den and sit at these counters it was just such a moving story and then as it turns out it was the 60th 5th anniversary of the sit in in August so we shot our thing and then right after that a whole bunch of people that were part of the original sit in movement were going to be in town so we were like oh my gosh We've we this story has to be told. The credit needs to be given to, to Miss Looper on a national level for starting this sit-in movement. Um, let's bring these folks together and shoot a round table and we can use it as the framework to move into another documentary, whatever that documentary winds up being. So we we partnered with Marilyn, um, the Freedom Center, uh, Christina Beatty, um, who's the executive director there, as well as Carlos Hill, who was at OU. Um, and we put our heads together and we did a round table. So we interviewed, um, I believe there were 10 individuals that were original sit inners and we talked to them for, yeah, three hours just listening to... Um, what what happened and it was it was absolutely riveting and now you know we're we're working to figure out who the right who who right to sort of partner with getting the rest of the documentary fully yeah. produced it's so awesome and like the thing and and i i've kind of got this too just from meeting people sharing stories like you can't help but feel inspired by being around these people right because for the most part the stories that you're telling yeah they might be successful people but it comes down to they're just normal people just like you and me that have just done something extraordinary they might not even think it's extraordinary but like they did it because they felt like it was the right thing to do mm -hmm. and you know you're, you're telling these stories and, and it's going to happen more and more that like you know there's probably some moments already that you just like I mean sat there just like completely flabbergasted it was just like wow yeah well when you think about like going back to that story I mean because we, we we grew up with it here mm -hmm. um, and you kind of knew about it and you knew roughly who Clara Looper was and you kind of knew what the sit-in movement was. When you think about the fact that like, you know, the Tulsa race riot was in 1921. So 30 years late, I mean, there's, there's still a, a, a you know, that is deeply impacted yeah. the community in 1958. There's still reverberation there, but Emmett Till was a, was a, I believe he was 14, had been killed two years earlier, you know? And so then, you know, as the story goes, Clara Looper, was a teacher and she had a group of students that, that had written a, a play and they were going to take a bus to New York City to perform this play. 
at the NAACP. So she takes these kids and suddenly they go from not being able to sit at lunch counters and use water fountains and shared restrooms to being able to do that. So they taste their freedom and then she deliberately drives them back through the South so that freedom is not only stripped away, but they're dropped into the most vitriolic part of the country. Uh, And then they come back to Oklahoma and she basically says, what do you want to do about it? Um, And so on the wake of like these terrifying like things being Emmett Till and Tulsa. The, she says, you know, the way that we're going to move the needle is let's let's use the kids. And so the children came together and they said, let us do it. These, you know, 7 to 17, they, they say, we're going to walk in uh, knowing they're going to get coffee thrown at them, they're going to get called names, they're going to get, you know, t- taunted. Um, Marilyn talks about a chimpanzee getting thrown on her, like these, these horrible things, but they did it for four or five years. Um, and you're right. Like the, the heroics of that are, are staggering. And like, you know, for me, I, I just, it felt like a story that absolutely had to be, has to be told, you know, there, and we have an obligation as storytellers to figure out how to get it done. Mm -hmm. Um, so we were very, very lucky to, to get to sort of begin that process yeah is there any um you know obviously that's like a pretty epic story and massive you know for all different reasons um is there any that you have kind of in the bank right now that you're super excited about that you can talk about so the jewel theater doc um we're we're sort of moving towards kind of picture lock on that which i think is going to be really really good uh we have the clara looper one which has just kind of started and then the last one we did um uh, is a fascinating story that came to us when we first started Prairie Surf. Um, uh, there was a guy named David Robach who was involved with the Oklahoma Proton Center, and he and he reached out to us and he was like, he wanted to make a documentary on proton therapy, and I was like, I don't know, <laughs> just for you, mate, just for you. I, I no don't one know. Else is, no I, one I don't know. Watching. But but like all things, I mean, you know, you talk about okay, well, here's this guy. He's really passionate yeah. about proton therapy. Why do you want this story told? And so he goes on to to tell us the story. He goes, well, well, what's interesting about it is the scientist that was really behind the particle accelerator, which became the technology that was ultimately used in proton therapy, and who wrote the paper about the fast uses of of uh, protons. Is this was also the lead researcher on the Manhattan Project? Oh, yeah. So you so and and was so wrecked with guilt that dis, he he decided that he would take the technology that that he had been part of and turn it into something good. And I was like, oh, that is a really really cool story. Um, and so uh, you know, again, like it's it's kind of there's a lesson in like kind of mining for story because at first you're like. I don't really think a documentary about proton therapy is what we want to make. But then when you start thinking about the fact that every single child that has a cancer diagnosis is going to be treated with proton therapy because it's the safest way. It ensures that their, their, their development can continue and mothers with soft, you know, tissue cancer get to live longer and have less, you know, they don't have to have radiation and chemotherapy a lot of times. That's a tremendous outcome from the Manhattan project. And so we started uh, talking about it and then, so the guy's name is Robert Wilson, and he was also became the executive director of Fermi Lab, which is, um, if you're a science nerd, that is where the largest particle accelerator, I believe in the United States of America for a long time, it was the world, okay. exists. It's where they found quarks and neutrinos. Like, they're doing the most advanced kind of subatomic research in the world. He was also the executive director of, of that place. So, yeah. um, and what he sought to create at Fermi Lab, if you go there, it's like this far, it's like got it like a farm and there's like bison herds and art and all this amazing thing. Well, what he basically did was he, he loved the environment at Los Alamos, the concentration of scientists. Like it was the coolest thing that's ever happened in the history of the world, which is the smartest, youngest people in the world come together to solve the world's biggest problem in a, in a vacuum. So it was like they talked about like, you know, in it, they talk about how like, um, like despite the fact that they're building a, an, an atomic bomb and like there's a world war, like they were having fun and they were drinking and it was the most challenging, unbelievable environment in the world, but it had this horrible outcome. So he was wrecked with guilt and he decides I'm going to build it again. And so he builds this national lab. Um, and so what we're doing, so Yes, we're making a documentary about proton therapy to some degree, but what we're really making is a documentary about this this, sci- this scientist that was directly involved with the Manhattan Project. So as we think about the success of Oppenheimer, we're, we'll be looking at a full cut of that movie on Friday, um, 
we hope to to have it complete um, and now it's kind of circulating as as Oppenheimer's getting considered for an Oscar. Yeah. So it's a cool project. Yeah, like you're right though. When when someone Lee comes to you and says, I want to do, you know, a documentary about proton therapy and you're like, Tell me more. And then you're like open the door and you think, well, why don't you lead with that to start? Yeah. Right? Like, you know, but you're right. You've got to dig and you've got to, like, I guess it's the part of your job to kind of dig these stories out of people, but also teach people how to tell these stories. Yeah. Right. And then that's kind of the education part too. Cause no one, they're not in the business that you are. Right. They sure. just know a story that, Oh, my granddad or my dad, or I do this and I think it's cool. And here's some facts about it. Yep. Yeah. They never really think, well, why? Like, because we're going to ask why. Tell me more. Who mm-hmm. is involved? And the, the easiest questions is who, what, why, and how. Sure. Right? And you find out so much from that. Sure. But yeah, it's impressive. Yeah. You know, I think, it, it, yeah, people don't, and a lot of times, like, people, they don't even know why their story matters, you know, or they'll tell, like, I always talk about my grandfather was a, uh, had this incredible life. Like, he was a, a um, Grew up a Mormon in Ripley, Oklahoma, just outside of Stillwater. Uh, went on a mission in the 20s when he was young, you know. Comes back, becomes an attorney. He's the youngest DA in the history of Payne County. Uh, enlists, even though he didn't have to, in World War II. And then he gets captured by the Japanese uh, on Corregidor Island. And then he goes through this like kind of mini death march. And then he's a prisoner of war, but then he escapes. And he lives in the jungles of the... And his life goes on, and then he esca- you know, he escapes. And then he's recaptured, and then he comes back to Oklahoma. He becomes a Supreme Court justice of the state of Oklahoma. And then he's involved with this giant scandal where he uncovers corruption. His life's just unbelievable. It's epic. He's written two books. Um... Then people will be like, you should make a movie about your grandfather. And you're like, which part of his life? You know, yeah. they, th- you know, in people's brains, they're like, well, d- his whole life. You're like, can you imagine a movie that is as disjointed as what I just said? The component parts are totally fascinating. Yeah. So what I try to help people do is go, what version of this do you want to tell? Like, if you want to write, like, the book of your grandfather's life, here's the expected outcome. You know, oh, you press might publish it, but you're probably not going to make it. There's a short film that you could make about a man in a village. There is a war, a World War II documentary that you could make. There's a screenplay that you could write about Supreme Court corruption. You could fictionalize it in some capacity and turn it into a an animated. There's so many things you can do, and it's fun when you get people thinking about that stuff because then they're like, oh, and then and then they get sort of hit with infinite possibilities, and you begin to shape them towards something that will have like a net positive outcome for them because what people want is they just they want their stories told and they want to be able they want them told but they want to share them Mm -hmm. and so what is a digestible pragmatic cost effective way to get someone to tell their stories and then for us what what's cool is like every once in a while somebody comes in with a story about proton therapy that you're like why don't we just turn this into a documentary and then we do it you know um so the sky's kind of the limit, you know, and for us, like yeah. now we just, you know, we, we're going to continue to partner with businesses and nonprofits and, and institutions to help them to amplify their storytellers, use that as a way to sort of train people up and get people thinking about story differently. And then, um, take all of that sort of goodwill and all those resources and begin to, um, expand upon the the Oklahoma stories we're telling yeah what's like the um I mean you know obviously when you sat down and put this together like what's like the look down this down the road 20 30 years like of prairies of creative like what do you see in the future for it, that it, yeah great question I mean it, it, so we, we've got this studio um you know we've got productions like Tulsa King we've got productions like you know other ones that have filmed here yeah. um, that are all pretty major and I, uh, that's great it's great that Hollywood wants to develop content and they want to send content here to get made I think for me you know what my goal with creative is is to get to a place where we're able to develop these Oklahoma stories into like truly scripted content so like I'll point to the Clara Looper story you know it's it's we can make a documentary about that a simple documentary but like at the root of it is really like an amazing feature film if not a, a, a limited series so the idea would be like can we get and you know we're, we're training these young people like look at Sterling Harjo I mean he's the most amazing guy in Oklahoma film there there are more Sterling Harjos out there um, can we find him can we help develop him so that in you know three to five years instead of having to like cross our fingers that you know 
Paramount or whomever like has a project that fits into Oklahoma, it's that we have this unbelievable Oklahoma talent that people are investing in, and then that talent is filming in our stage. That's that's where we want to get. Gotcha. Um, and the way that you do that is like you've got to get people to work. You've got to train people to tell stories effectively, and you've got to bring people back that know how to do it well. And so. Yeah. Um, as much as it is about building a, another division of our business, it's about building a more creative ecosystem and even more creative ecosystem yeah. because there are some brilliant filmmakers in Oklahoma that are about to have huge moments. You know, it's exciting. Oh, it's super exciting. And, you know, like you've already got the roadmap ready to go. You've already got the infrastructure. It's just kind of putting the pieces together and finding the stories. And thankfully, the stories are coming to you. So it's more about sifting through the stories and finding the ones that you really want to work on and, you know, you're, you're always going to have a back catalog of, okay, we don't have anything. Let's go to the catalog and see what we have, the stories we have in the bank. And, okay, let's go pick this one and go do sure. this one, right? So that's the great thing. Um, on a more personal level, I know you don't get out to take photos like you used to, <laughs> but you have been taking more photos, I think, recently. You've been tagging me yeah. more photos recently. So what's that been like to just get out and shoot and just kind of be free for 30 minutes a day maybe? Uh, good good question. Um yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, I think if I could make millions of dollars uh, being just a, a nature photographer, I would do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, if I did, yeah, if I didn't feel compelled to, to do so many other things, I, I love taking pictures. But um, yeah, man, I got out. So when we had that gi those giant storms the other night, I did I, um, that huge cloud that everyone that took a photo of. That big cloud that looked like a nuclear bomb. <laughs> yeah, um, it looked so, like Independence Day. Yeah, so I, yeah. I lived on a farm, and if you follow me at Matt Payne Travel Photography, um, you probably see my work. If you follow This Is Oklahoma, you've for sure seen it. Um, but I was on a farm, so I took pictures every single day of my life, and I didn't. my life wasn't quite as stressful when I lived on the farm. So I had a, a, just a bit more free time to sort of indulge uh, creative uh, endeavors. Um, but I moved, we moved to the city and, but I, and I, I live right down the street from Lake Hefner. And what I've discovered is if I, if I pay attention to the clouds and I get in my car, I can get to Hefner to take a cool sunset. So I'm always kind of watching the sky, uh, and the clouds. Yeah. And, um, if there's an opportunity to take a picture, um, I get out and do it. But man, I miss, I, I, I really do miss, um, taking photos. It's just such a, yeah. it's a powerful thing. And, uh, you know, we live in such a. Oklahoma is so it's so much fun to photograph mm -hmm. yeah everything's different every yeah. day is different right yeah it's different I mean I always talk about you know I, you, again like thinking about Prairie Surf Creative like going back to for me you know when I lived in LA like you know, you, you have the ocean. There's nat there are multiple national parks within you know five six hour drives. Um, it's it's you know there's Joshua Tree and Santa Barbara and the Channel Islands. It's just it's a beautiful place, and there's lots of creativity there. But I, for whatever reason, when I was in California, there just wasn't there was so much of it you just didn't even kind of clock it. Versus like when I moved back to Oklahoma, kind of living on this farm, what wound up being um, really cool was like it's it's challenging to find cool shots like if you look up Lake Hefner photos I mean it's a lot of photos of the lighthouse yeah. you know what I mean like what I love doing is going like I, you know I'll ride my bike around the lake and you're looking for just like where are there cool foregrounds like where are things blooming that you know uh, we could use to dress up shots like where's the water still where's the water busy where's there wildlife you know you you begin to kind of map these out so I have like this shot list in my brain yeah. that I just wait for sky opportunities to kind of maximize on um, but yeah it's good for the soul man yeah. it, it um, Prairie Surf Creative has been a great thing um and just in terms of returning to creativity, we're still running a business. You know, yeah. you're still worried about getting this up and running and being successful and making sure that people aware are aware of what we do and what we offer and um, being able to get out and take a picture every now and again it means a lot. And I love it when people uh, engage. You know, it's cool to see like how right. um, excited people get when you get to share something beautiful about Oklahoma. People just go nuts over it. So yeah. it's been fun. Yeah, definitely. Well, let's bring this one home. Uh, people listening, if, if someone is listening to this and thinks my parents or my granddad or my aunt or whatever has an amazing story, how do they reach out? What's the practical stuff people can do to get in touch and, and maybe start the uh, conversation? 
Um, you know, for, I, I encourage everyone, you know, even if you're following Prairie Surf Media, go uh, follow us on uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, and uh, Instagram at Prairie Surf Creative uh, and shoot the ideas through those channels. That That's where to reach us. You can watch the Jewel trailer at uh, prairiesurfcreative.com. Uh, if you... Um, I, you know, if, if, if you like independent film, I think you'll really, I think you'll really dig it. So I encourage you to do that. And, um, you know, I think the other thing is, um, if you are excited about film in Oklahoma, um, let your legislators know, um, there's a lot of work still to be done legislatively. There's a lot of things, work to be done, uh, at the, in the workforce development at the, at the, uh, uh, higher ed level um let leadership know that this is an industry that you care about um that you want to work in you have stories you want to be told be vocal about the fact that this industry matters awesome well mate thanks for uh sharing some time taking some time out of your busy life and busy day to share some stories um hopefully one day we work on a project together and share some stories i know i absolutely had a blast absolute blast with the harold ham one i did and look forward to doing it you know many more times we will my friend appreciate it for everyone listening uh thanks so much we'll catch you next episode cheers hope you guys enjoyed that great episode thank you so much for listening as always huge shout out to our sponsors the oklahoma hall of fame share an oklahoma story through its people since 1927 for more information on the oklahoma hall of fame go to www.oklahomahof.com and follow them on instagram for daily updates at oklahoma hof our other sponsor the chickasaw nation amazing sponsor they do amazing things for the state and they're always sponsoring something in oklahoma they're a huge supporter of oklahoma and without their support we wouldn't be able to do what we do and our third sponsor is diffie ford lincoln down in el reno now this one makes me so happy because these guys are great friends of mine um play a lot of golf together i've bought my cars from them do most of my oil changes down there, have a cup of coffee, hang out down in El Reno. It's a good spot to go. And not only are they great friends, but they provide a great service. So for over 60 years, a third generation family owned Oklahoma business down in El Reno. They're also in Bethany as well. So people in the Bethany area know the Diffies really well. But if you're looking for anything new used, um, Ford, Lincoln, or whatever, I'm sure they could find anything you want. Um, check them out, diffieford.net, and then on Instagram at diffiefordlincoln. Thank you for listening. We are inspired by those around us and hope that you are too. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a review so we can keep telling your stories. For more great Oklahoma content, follow This Is Oklahoma on Facebook and Instagram.